right, yeah, recording for 110 uh, acoustics and psychoacoustics. Yeah, last week uh, <laughs> I had a, a trip of a Zoom session. It cut off halfway in between. Something on my computer went, went nuts, so I had to do it again. Anyway, here's hoping that you've watched the 110 Zoom session from last week. And if today is March 27, we'll be talking the one March 20. Be sure you have watched that one before watching this one. Otherwise, you're going to be thinking I smoked some crack or something. You're going to be wondering what the Sam Hill I'm talking about. So it really, this Zoom session really hinges on that one. So I will share screen here. And by the way, yeah, I'll talk to you about 120. Also, we're way ahead in 120. So last week's Zoom session on 120 from March 20, uh, from March the 20th, is a good one to watch too because it's a real review, and uh, we didn't even finish uh, inner ear physiology on that one either. I just reviewed, reviewed, reviewed. So anyway, here we go. I will uh, share screen, and we'll look at where we are in psychoacoustics today. Oh boy, just make sure, Ted, you don't push the wrong button like you did last week. That was a humdinger. Okay, so when we look at from the top, last week we talked about differential threshold, and we said you can have a just noticeable difference for intensity, a JND for frequency, a JND for duration, and we said last week that means you already hear something, you're just looking for the smallest change required for you to notice that there's a change. And you can change the frequency by a hertz or two, or you can change the intensity by a decibel or two. What's the smallest change required for you to notice a change? And then we dropped into absolute threshold, middle of your page here. And I said, differential threshold is largely what's done in research, but I did say last week too, to really put a star by number two, in differential threshold and I said that because when you lose hair cells you really lose the ability to distinguish between frequencies close together that's because your just noticeable difference or difference Lyman or Delta F isn't as good anymore you can your fine-tuning has gone and that's why people hate hearing aids they have difficulty separating speech from background noise precisely because their fine-tuning regarding frequency has gone down the toilet so they can't distinguish between frequencies close together therefore they have difficulty in background noise with hearing aids we launched into absolute threshold next talking about this is what we do in our lives as HISs, we test thresholds. And that's different from differential, that's absolute threshold. Did you hear it or did you not? What's the softest decibel required for you to just barely hear? And we said that when you get the sound really, really soft, then you've got the devil or the snake crawls under the door and it's called noise. And you can see it there highlighted. And noise doesn't just mean physical background noise. It's any of the crap that interferes with your hearing the tone. Because when I'm really soft, you're not sure if you hear the tone. And we showed you this picture last week too. Very important that we look at something. Here you go. If you heard a tone and you had normal hearing and the tone was 50 dB and you could easily hear it, well, every time the tone was present, you'd say, yup, and that's a true positive. And every time the tone was absent, you'd say, nope, and that's a true negative. But look at the next slide here, because if I go make the tone 5 dB, now I'm close to your hearing threshold because let's say if you can hear down to zero, five isn't much more than zero. So now you're squinting and it's harder for you to hear. And yes, sometimes when the tone is present, you're gonna say, yup. Sometimes when the tone is absent, you're gonna say, nope. Those are true positives, true negatives, but you're also gonna make mistakes. And you're sometimes gonna raise your hand when the tone was absent, false positive, or you'll keep your hand down when the tone was present, false negative, okay? Maybe you, you turned your head and your shirt rubbed against your neck, or maybe you breathed, or maybe you swallowed, or something interfered, okay? And now back to the notes, then we said, 
bias can also affect threshold. And bias can be the subject bias, okay? Maybe, and I gave you the example of Herb or Mrs. McGillicuddy, and Herb being very hesitant because he doesn't want to be at the test in the first place. Or Mrs. McGillicuddy, who's really eager, and she's eager beaver, and she wants to pass the test. And Herb is going to be tending to be biased toward false negatives. Whereas Mrs. McGillicuddy, the school teacher, is going to be biased maybe to raise her hand even when she's not sure she hears the tone. So she's going to be biased toward false positives. I call her the chicken and I call her the Las Vegas gambler. Okay? So one's internal bias is also, going to, you know, if someone's going to, only going to raise a hand when he or she is only sure that he hears the tone, then you're going to be keeping your hand down a lot. And I'll stop sharing for just a second and really bring this point home in terms of clinic because you will run into this in your clinical practicums and when you observe. And you're going to see some client who's going to be, his internal rule is going to be, I'm only going to raise my hand when I'm sure I hear the tone. And he may even raise his hand like, you know, whereas Mrs. McGillicuddy is, and you, you have, you'll raise your hands and go, I haven't even pushed a button yet. Okay, so these internal biases, you as a clinician have to pull them into the center. And you'll be having to say to Herb, guess a little more. And you'll have to say to Mrs. McGillicuddy, raise your hand when you're a little more sure. Okay, just so these are just things I think people should keep in mind regarding hearing testing. And that's how this course gets clinically relevant. It deals with psychoacoustics. Psychoacoustics sits right between acoustics and your hearing lives and what you're doing in, in clinic. So it's a something to consider here. So share screen here again and we wind on down. We covered all of that. We also said language barrier. That can be noise in quotes. Okay, stimulus parameters, number four. How long did you let the person hear the tone? Did you just go, Bip? or did you, and hold the tone for a couple of seconds? Okay, stimulus parameters. And now in number five, you're talking equipment. Oh, now you're talking equipment, okay, and, and uh, or environment, I should say. Now you're talking background noise. Is there noise in the environment? Only now at number five are we getting to external background noise, like actual physical noise. So you can see a lot of stuff in here. Same with equipment. Is your equipment calibrated? Is zero decibels really zero dB, or is it one or two? So let's get into some of that because the way we test clinic is through the method of limits we said last week. And the method of limits is defined as you, the clinician, adjust the intensity and the frequency. The client responds by raising a hand or pushing a button to let you know. And the second thing about method of limits is you're adjusting the tone in fixed increments. You're not testing at 712 hertz. You're testing at 125, 250, 500, 1,000, dot, dot, dot. and you're also adjusting your decibels in 5 dB steps. So you're never testing at 43 decibels. You're testing at 40 or 45, okay? So those two elements comprise the method of limits. And then we said you can apply the method of limits in different ways. And here you go. If you look at the slide here, I'll take you home. You could, if I descended and descended from say 60 to 50 to 40 to 30 until you didn't hear the tone, or if I ascended from zero to five to 10 to 15 to 20, etc., which is going to give you the better hearing level. In other words, the softest level, which is going to give you the softer decibel level where you're going to raise your hand. And the answer, of course, is on the left, the descending, because you know what to listen for. You've already heard the tone, so now you know what to hear. And that is why we went to the Houston Westlake approach, which uses both of these. And we said we go down in 10 until you don't hear it anymore, and then you go up by five until you do. And if you heard it once, we mark that level down. 
Then we'll go down by 10 dB and you don't hear it. We'll go up by five, you don't hear it. We'll go up by five and if you hear it again at that same dB level, that's threshold. And then we'll move to 2000 Hertz and we'll do the same thing. We'll start at a level that you hear, descend, descend, descend until you don't hear it and we'll descend in 10 decibel steps until you don't. And then when you do hear, then we'll raise in five dB steps until you do. And you ascend, and, when, and, and, and the, the rule is when the tone is heard at two ascending steps at the same dB level. That's threshold. Good. All right, so we've got that. This is just review, moving down the page now. So now we get to where we're starting today. So we took like almost 15 minutes of review. But it's very important to get to this step here to now move on. All right. What did we say in acoustics last year or last semester? Actually, last semester, before your midterm. What's zero dB SPL? Okay, what was that? And we said it's the softest it takes for a normal hearing human to hear a 1000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. Remember the three conditions, 1000 hertz tone at one meter distance with two ears. Okay, and we called that, that was 0 0.0002 dimes per centimeter squared, and we called that zero dB SPL. Great, okay, fine and dandy. Now let's play the same game at 2000 hertz. Let's play a 2,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. And what's the softest it takes for the person to just barely hear the 2,000 hertz tone? And then let's do a 4,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. And then an 8,000 hertz tone. And then a 125 hertz tone. In other words, the seven octave frequencies that we test hearing. Instead of just doing it at 1,000 hertz, let's play the same game at all the different frequencies. And when you do that, it's called minimal audible field. M-A-F is the softest it takes to hear all the different frequencies at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. All right, so now we'll share screen and look at what we've got in terms of minimal audible field. Move on down, move on down, ding, da, ding, down, move on down, move on down, here are you. And what are you going to get? Minimal audible field. Look at the bottom. And the bottom of the picture shows you this. You'll see a curve. Okay, and now look at a thousand hertz on this picture right here. And look where it's going to the left. We call that zero. That's zero dB SPL. And look at how the curve actually goes down below zero at 2000 hertz and at 4000 and 5000. And then when you go above 5000 hertz, look at that, the curve rises again. And look what happens when you go below 1,000 hertz to 500, and then to 250, and then to 100. We don't even test hearing at 100. 125 we do. And then, but even if we had checked at 50 hertz, like, look at the shape. It's almost like a smile. It's, it's a curve. And note that sometimes it actually goes below zero. So remember, we never think zero dB SPL is the absence of sound. It isn't. Okay, when you're walking with your honey and your nose is kind of runny and the people think it's funny, but it's not. Okay, it's not. <laughs> Sorry to throw that at you, but if I can make anything remember that, it's that zero dB SPL does not mean the absence of sound. It's the softest it took to hear a 1000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. And we called that zero. Well, guess what? At 2,000 hertz, you can hear below zero. And at 4,000, you hear below zero. And at, look at it, 100 hertz, it takes you 40. It takes you 40 decibels to just barely hear 100 hertz. So, and, and at 500 hertz, it probably takes you about 10, maybe seven, something like that. 
And at 8,000 hertz, it takes you probably about the same, about, I don't know, five, I should say around 10-ish, eight, nine, something like that. I don't walk around with these numbers in my head. I just know that we have uneven hearing sensitivity across the frequencies. Our ears are better at some frequencies than at other frequencies. And guess which ear? Look at the most important frequencies. Look at the best frequencies. Basically, it's between 1,000 and 4,000 hertz. That's our best hearing. Now, you want to tie that together with what you learned in complex sounds. Look before your midterm. What are the most important sounds of speech? The consonants. The consonants tell you what the word was. And we said that vowels are loud and consonants are really soft. In vowels, you've got five vowels and all the words, have, every word in English has a vowel. So we have to, thousands of words share five vowels. What makes words different is the consonants. And what are the consonants? High frequency. And where are they? Between one and 4,000 hertz. That's, tie that together now with M. A F. Look at the shape of your ear. It resonates as a quarter wave resonator, and it resonates with sounds between one to four thousand hertz. Your ear is made for speech. They're connected. And if we didn't talk, we probably would have a dog or cat's ears. See, I told you you have to keep this crap in mind because as we move ahead, MAF now is talking from psychoacoustics, our perception of sound, okay, matches the acoustics of speech. And then our ears are made naturally to resonate with those all important sounds of speech. And that is seen in minimal audible field, MAF. And another way to look at that curve is to say, say this, MAF represents threshold. So look at every frequency along MAF, and every frequency along MAF curve is heard equally loud. How loud? Just barely audible. That's how loud. Now think about it again. Acoustics, okay, and psychoacoustics. Loudness is your perception of intensity. Pitch is your perception of frequency. So let's talk loudness. Every frequency along the MAF curve, watch my cursor as I'm moving it across the screen, every frequency along this curve is heard equally loud. How loud? Just barely audible. That's how loud. And see how loudness is different from intensity? Because they're very different intensities, totally different intensities, but they're all heard equally loud. And that's because of the red, our ears resonate with some frequencies and they don't with other ones, but I don't care. Nonetheless, the intensities are all different along the curve, but the loudness is equal along the curve. See what I'm saying? All right, M-A-F. Okay, don't worry about the 40 and the 1,000 and the 120 up here, okay? We'll talk about that next week. We're not there yet. Let's just leave, focus on M-A-F right now. Okay, now we're going to move to the next slide. And now you're looking at M-A-P. M-A-P, minimal audible pressure. And this may come up because someone might say, well, hey, man, we don't test hearing when you're sitting in front of a speaker. Okay, we test hearing with this ear under a headphone and this ear under a headphone. We don't test hearing when someone's sitting in front of a speaker at one meter distance. So you may have MAF, but big hairy deal. That just doesn't mean anything clinically. We need to get clinical, clinical. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the same experiment that we did with MAF, only this time we're going to do it with one ear under a headphone. Now we're going to play a thousand hertz with one ear under a headphone, and we're going to mark down the softest decibel level it took to hear. Then we're going to test at 2,000 hertz with one ear under a headphone and mark down, down those decibels. And then we're going to test with one ear under a headphone at 4,000 hertz and with one ear under a headphone at 8. 
and then we'll test one ear with under a headphone with 125, with 250, and 500 hertz, all seven octave frequencies. Let's check this out and see what happens now. And when we do, you've got M A P. Okay, now notice this curve and contrast it to the first one. I'm going to go back a slide here. M A F. Focus on MAF, and look at how long it goes over to the left. Well, we don't test hearing down at 50, okay? We're not there. So right away, MAP has that cut off. But a second thing about MAP is that it's a little bit higher up on the screen. Look, MAF, look where zero, look where 1,000 hertz is, right at zero here. Now look at this one. It raised. It went up by a few dB. And you know why? It's very simple. Two ears are better than one. <laughs> okay? Hey, two ears are better than one. Simple, slain and pimple. Okay? So if one ear has a threshold of 10 dB and the other hearing ear has a threshold of 10 dB, binaurally your threshold's about five. If one ear has a threshold of 40 dB and the other ear has a threshold of 40 dB, binaurally your threshold's about 35. Okay, two ears are about 5 dB better than one ear, honestly and truly, okay? So never think a one-eared person has a 50% hearing loss. They don't. They got about a 5% hearing loss. Their difficulty is localizing the direction of sound. And we'll talk about that later, manana. Right now, let's focus on MAP. So when you're looking at MAP, now we're getting closer to our goal of testing hearing. Look, it took about 40 decibels to just barely hear 125 hertz. It took about 30 decibels to just barely hear 250 hertz. It took about maybe a little more than 10 to hear 500 hertz. It took about 10 dB to hear 1,000 hertz. It took about three or four to hear 2,000 hertz. And at four, oh, we're almost down at zero, just about. And then at five, it, gets, it takes more. And then at eight, it takes more, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, the smile became a little shorter and elevated. Now, how now, brown cow? Looky, looky. M-A-P, we take those decibels and we build them into our audiometers, the things which we use to test hearing. These decibel differences, this MAP, the values of MAP are built into your audiometer and now we're going to test and we test hearing like this. And this MAP, follow that curve, is zero. Okay, and that's zero what? Zero decibels HL. Look at the axis. DBHL, hearing level. So now we've built this zero is, and I mean it, capital I-S, underline, italics, boldface, M-A-P, is zero DBHL. Or zero DBHL is M-A-P. Okay, and now you have your second reference for hearing. You had your first reference was 0 dB SPL. Now you've got your second reference, 0 dB HL. So SPL is the bottom underlying reference of references, the king of king, of the lord of lords, the what, holy of holies, whatever you want to call it, okay? That's the underlying ma major one. But now let's look at the human race. And what's zero for the human race? And that's zero dB HL. Now I can do a hearing test. Because who wants to sit there with all these different numbers? I mean, do I really want to say that normal hearing at 125 hertz is 40, and normal hearing at 500 hertz is 30, and normal hearing at 500 hertz is 17, and normal hearing hertz at 1,000 is 10? I've got all those different values all the time to call normal. Hell, why not just build it all in and call it zero? Okay, so now it's flat. But in all reality, this flat 0 dB HL line across the top actually represents very different SPLs across the frequencies. But that's built 
into the machine, the audiometer that's used to test your hearing. And that's why we said in the notes, some of the noise that takes place in threshold testing, what did we say it was? If I share screen and go to the notes, let's look at our notes. What, Sam Hill, let me get to the notes here, if I can. Okay, stop sharing. Where's the notes? Come on, Venom, where's the, where the heck are you going here? Find your, find your ding-dong notes and see if you can get there. Oh, I don't know why I can't, but oh, let's see. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to figure out where, how, how to get to my good old, there, finally. All right, if we ascend the page, here, equipment, number six. Is your audiometer calibrated? Is it calibrated to match MAP? Or did you bump into it and all of a sudden you, you, you bumped it out of calibration? Guess what? Your audiometers need to be calibrated every year. That's a law. You have to pay someone about 500 bucks to come into your clinic, and this is what that person does for a living. Actually, I'm going to tell you something. If you go to the Missouri Hearing Society Conference, or you go to the Iowa Hearing Association, or the Kansas Speech and Hearing Association, you go to any state conference, an annual hearing conference, and you're going to notice about half the attendees are bringing in portable audiometers. They're bringing in their audiometers. How come? Because they're getting them calibrated. Somebody at the, at the conference is being paid to calibrate your audiometers, and a lot of people bring their portable audiometers in. Otherwise, they have the person come to their office and do it. And when, they, when so they've calibrated, they lick a sticker, stick it on the side of your audiometer, now you're good for another year. It's just like license plates on your car. Same. you got to pay to get it legal, okay? You have to pay to get your audiometers calibrated so that 0 dB HL is exactly MAP. All right, now we're starting to get somewhere talking clinic. All right, share screen. So let's read what we've done. We'll just, we'll just read what we've, what we've talked about in terms of PowerPoint. I'm going to grab a coffee here a sec. Ah, all right. Intensity obviously affects threshold, but then again, so does frequency. M-A-F, minimal audible field, thresholds, with subject facing the sound source, listening with two ears in an anechoic chamber at one meter distance from the speaker. Depending on the frequency, two ears give about 5 dB better hearing than one ear. See below. MAP. Very different numbers across the frequencies shows our best hearing is between 1 and 4,000 hertz. The curve is due to the resonances of your outer and middle ears. What is the resonance of your middle ear ossicles? 2,000 hertz. Okay, so you look at the resonances of your outer ear, the resonances of your middle ear, that's what gives rise to M. A, F, and M, A, P. Now, M, A, P looks a little bit different, and I'll show you why as well. It has a little bit of a bump in it. I'll show you this picture here. And when you're looking here, you can see the resonances of your outer and middle ears together. On the left, outer ear canal resonance. On the right, middle ear resonances of the middle ear space, the middle ear ossicles, all of that. And look at the bottom. I'll pull it up even closer here so you see it. Okay, M-A-F, M-A-P. So on the left plus that on the right equals the bottom. Okay, ear canal resonance, outer ear canal resonance plus middle ear canal resonance equals the fact that important speech frequencies are emphasized. And look at how M-A-P has a little bump. M-A-P has a little bump on the top of it, you know, n'est-ce pas, a little bump. How come? Because you're plugging up the ear with a headphone. And once you've plugged up the ear with a headphone, you've driven a truck over this outer ear canal resonance. You've blocked it, remember? Your outer ear canal resonance is a quarter weight, like a cup. Your ear, what's a quarter wave resonator? A cylinder closed at one end. Well, now you've closed the cylinder at both ends. <laughs> you've put a headphone on it. So this part here is gone, or you've ruined it somewhat, okay? And that's why you've got that little bump right around 2,000 hertz. 
at any rate. Let's just get this to talk to you, okay? Okay. This slide is just a review from before your midterm. And again, look at the left corner in yellow. 0 0.0002 dynes per centimeter squared is zero dBSPL. And that's how we defined zero dBSPL. But then we said, let's play the same game at other frequencies. And when we play the same game at other frequencies, what do you get? M-A-F. And then when you play the same game with a headphone on the ear, M-A-P. And what do we call M-A-P? Zero dBHL. Therein lies the progression. Four steps. Take your fingers and count the four steps. 0 dB SPL, minimal audible field, minimal audible pressure to 0 dB HL. Now we can test hearing. Okay? Very important to have digested this and digested it well. All right. We'll go back to our good old notes here. Let's see where we are. And this audiogram, let's just kind of, I'll pull this audiogram and you can look at it closer again. Because this is what you're going to be using for the rest of your career. So let's look at this audiogram and make it our buddy. Make it your friend. Look at it now. DBHL on an audiogram. Audiograms is where you're marking down your hearing test. Right and left ears. The right ear is going to be letter O. And the left ear is going to be a letter X. Okay, X's and O's, we play tic-tac-toe. All right, so the numbers go from minus 10 down to 120 because some people have better than average hearing. Sometimes people can hear at minus 10, dBHL, okay? But look at the seven octave frequencies, 125, 250, 500, 1, 2, 4, and 8. And then look at how you've got these dotted lines in between. Well, let's say, for example, if I make this smaller, and if I go home here, and if I, let's see, if I inserted a text here, why don't I just say insert, and not a text box. I really don't want to insert a text box. What if I just want to, oh, I don't, don't do that, Ted. No, nah, no, nah, you don't want to mess with that. Leave that one alone. But let's say if I want to write down a letter, Okay, <clears throat> I'll just, in, yeah, I will insert a text box here. Why not? Boom. Okay. So I can write over here. Well, let's see if I, I'm just playing here. Bear with me. Yeah, I'm just pooping around here. Okay, text box. You might want to try the draw feature. Got it. Oh, thank you. There's an O. Oh, great. Look at this. Okay, so let's say the person hears, thank you, Audra. Let's say the person hears, like so. Okay, whoops. Take that little guy here. Move it over here. So now you can say that it took the guy 10 decibels to just barely hear that sound. So now let's say, if, okay, if I say, if I grab that guy and say, copy and paste and okay, and move that guy over here. And now it took him that many decibels to hear at 500 hertz, and so on. You can just draw your thresholds, okay? And then the X's, you do the same thing. X's would represent the left ear. And in high-frequency hearing loss, if you follow my cursor, the hearing would go down like this in the treble frequencies. Good hearing in the bass, meaning fewer decibels were required to just barely hear, and worse hearing in the treble, meaning more decibels were required to hear the high frequencies. And now look at the dotted lines. Those are the mid frequencies. So if there's a big decibel difference, for example, I'm going to move this guy over here. Let's say... It was like this. There's a great big decibel difference. Well, then you'd want to test the mid frequencies to find out is the mid frequency here or was the mid frequency threshold here. So when there's a more than a 20 decibel difference between adjacent frequencies, that's when you check the mids. Okay, that's what those dotted lines are. Then there's four of them 750, 1500. 3,000, 6,000. 
okay? And you only really test those mid frequencies when you've got more than 20 decibels, or I should say 20 or greater difference between adjacent octave frequencies. So there you have it, okay? Anyway, there's a, it's a whole story here, and that's why if you hadn't listened to last week's Zoom session, and this one isn't going to make a lot of sense, but it does if you have. So here's M A P. This is zero dB HL. Threshold subjects are sitting there listening under headphones with one ear at a time. Clinical audiometry, I write down here. Don't worry about the exact numbers. Never think you need to memorize what the numbers are. Who cares? Nobody cares. Okay, just the fact that you do hear some frequencies better than other frequencies. Note the bubble or the bump on MAP, and that's because external ear canal or ear external auditory meatus, ear canal resonance, is gone when you've plugged up the ear canal with a headphone. We've talked about that, so move on down. There you go. Besides intensity and frequency, the duration of sound also affects Threshold. So frequency affects threshold, obviously. I mean, otherwise you wouldn't have MAP or you wouldn't have MAF. Okay, obviously frequency is affecting threshold. Intensity, duh, obviously affects threshold. But then so does duration. So if we go to this weird one here, see if I can find that. Well, here's another couple of drawings of MAF and MAP. These are just meant for your own perusal. Okay, I just wrote these in here to make it clearer. I often do this presentation at conferences as well, but so I'm just throwing in some PowerPoint slides. Okay, here's MAF. Okay, da, 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 da. best frequencies right there. Okay, and we call, and at 1000, we call that 0 dB SPL. It's all good. Minimal audible field, minimal audible pressure now. The curve is raised. Oh, look at that. My internet connection is unstable. Hmm, do you see that too, Audra? Yeah, I hope so. I can still see you, so I guess we're still on. Whew. All right. And notice MAP is raised up about 5 dB. Notice the bump. Two ears are about 5 dB better than one ear. Okay. And then I said MAP is 0 dB HL. Now, the, on the left, you're going to see a weird gray audiogram. That's called an SPLogram. And when you're fitting hearing aids, okay, this is for next year. You're not there yet. But when you fit hearing aids in year two of this program, you're going to be doing something what they call real ear measurement. And you're actually going to be sliding a tube in the guy's ear. And then you're going to be putting the hearing aid on top of that tube, turning the hearing aid on, and you will be measuring the sound coming out of that hearing aid. And you're going to be, and the, the audiogram that you drew here on the right is going to be translated by the computer so that it rises. Look at how these numbers go up. And those numbers are zero, or these numbers are decibels, S, P. L again. So you've taken the guy's hearing loss, you're adding MAP to it, and you're getting the guy's hearing loss plotted now going up in dBSPL. The, the asterisks represent your loudness tolerance, the loudest you can hear. So look at the dynamic range. The range of audibility for normal hearing goes from MAP all the way up to these asterisks, whereas this guy's floor has literally risen and yet his ceiling hasn't changed much. And so this is his dynamic range. And you want to make sure that the hearing aid is delivering sound so that the output is all inside his dynamic range that he can hear. So that soft speech, average speech, and loud speech, they call that mapping, speech mapping. Today's real ear, real ear means measurement of the hearing aid in your ear, and the mapping of speech. And you want to map aided speech so it sits between the floor and the ceiling of your loudness tolerance. But that's kind of going ahead a bit. But that's just where you will go in this course or in year two. You'll be talking a lot about real ear measurements. So now let's go to our notes and see where we are. Good. Oh, yes. Intensity, frequency, duration of sound also affects threshold. Okay, Venema, let's see if you can find that slide. 
let's go over to here, see if you got it. Eh, you might. Oh, here it is. There you go. All right. This is called, don't worry about all this. <gasps> it just frightens me. I hate that writing. So just leave the writing alone. Okay. Pretend I presented the tone to you for a split second. Let's say your threshold was zero. They get her all the way down to zero, and we'll call it zero dB HL. Pretend, okay? So you can hear all the way down to zero. But let's say I presented a thousand hertz to you for a split second, like five milliseconds. Look at the the vertical, the horizontal axis is duration milliseconds. So I present it to you for five milliseconds. Well, what's five milliseconds? Five one one thousandths of a second. That's like one two hundredth of a second. And if I presented the tone for you like dip, your threshold would probably be around 20 because it's too short. If I present it for 20 milliseconds, oh, your threshold gets a little bit better. Now you're at 10. And only when I get to about 200 milliseconds does your threshold now get to what it really is. That's what I mean by duration affecting threshold. Okay? So when you're testing hearing, Make sure that when you're testing Mr. Jones or Mrs. McGillicuddy, that you don't just go to it. <laughs> okay, hold that ding dong tone bar down for a few seconds. Let that person's nervous system grab the sensation of the sound. That's clinically relevant discussion about duration affecting threshold. So frequency affected threshold, intensity affects threshold, duration affects threshold, all of it does. That's why we call it a class on psychoacoustics. All righty. Now we will complete our discussion this morning and we're going to, we'll finish this topic next week, but here's what I want to take you to right now. This guy here. If you will look at this, we're going to call these psychometric functions. You can also call these PI functions, performance index functions. And I'll explain why I'm talking about this here. I just want to tell you this. Remember you saw MAP and MAF? So let's look at this. Okay, so let's just look at MAP or MAF. Doesn't matter which one. Who cares? Okay, just look at one of them. See that they're bent. Okay, now you move down. These are called PI, look at how 125 hertz needed to be more. Okay, look at your decibels. It needed more decibels. And it needed, and then 250 less decibels to hear. And then 500 less. And again, okay, 250 needed more, 500 needed less. Okay, we're all following here, okay? So that's why you've got a series of these lines moving from the left to the right, you know, right to left, whatever you want to call it. But now look at how steep they are. So let's say your threshold is, at, at 250 or whatever, is 25. Okay, let's say, pretend your threshold, let's talk about DBSPL. Let's say it took 25. Let's look at the MAP line and say it took 25 for you to hear 250 just for, for the fun of it. This means, okay, if it took you 25 to hear 250, if I presented it at 15, you're not gonna hear it. If I present it at 25, yep, you're usually gonna hear it most of the time, 75% correct. And if I present it to you at 30, you'll always hear it. Okay, so like, again, let's say your threshold is 25, and we'll call it DB SPL at 250 hertz, 25, okay, for an example. So if that's true, if I present the tone at 25, you're gonna hear it most of the time. But if I present it at 15 or 20, you're barely gonna hear it. And if I present it at 30, you're always gonna hear it. So here's the story. The decibel distance between getting it all or diddly all is small. Okay? Look where my cursor is. The decibel distance between getting it all the time or n almost never, that decibel distance is small. And that's why you call these steep PI functions, steep psychometric functions. You either heard it or you didn't. You crossed the threshold, you carried the bride across the threshold. Are you in the room or are you still in the hallway? Did you cross or did you not? When you hot, you hot. When you not, you not. The decibel distance 
from softer to louder that, that, that allows the person to always hear it, percent correct, or never hear it, that decibel distance is small for pure tones, isn't it? For all of them, the, 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 the functions are steep. Whether it's 125, 250, 4,000, 1,000, whatever, it's small. Good. Then we can talk about words. Now, as part of testing hearing, aside from the audiogram, okay, aside from, where the heck is my audiogram here? Oh, I'm going to go back up here. Aside from this guy here, a second part of hearing testing is called speech testing. After you've tested the person for pure tone hearing and you've assessed his right ear and left ear as to how he or she hears all the different frequencies and you've used that Houston Westlake ascending descending technique, blah, 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 and you've got all your X's and O's now on the audiogram, you move into the second part of the test and that's called speech testing. And when we do speech testing, one of the first tests we do is called speech reception threshold, S-R-T. What's the softest it took for you to hear the words? Okay, because that's a part, because what's the most important stimulus for the hearing impaired or for anybody in terms of hearing? Speech. So if you tested pure tones, great. Okay, that tells me the guy's hearing from bass to mids to treble. But what about his hearing for speech? All right. When we test hearing for speech, we use what's called spondy words, two-syllable words, and the words are made out of two different words, and they have even emphasis on both syllables. Sidewalk, cowboy, birthday, cupcake, ice cream, hardware, armchair, all these da 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 they're called spondy words. They're made out of two separate words, meatball, okay? They're made of two separate words, even emphasis on both syllables. And we always say, and so we start out and we do the same Houston Westlake procedure. We'll start out at say 70 or 60 and I'll cover my face. There go. Say hardware, okay, hardware, turn it down. Cupcake, turn it down to 50. Yep, he repeats it correctly, turn it down to 40. Airplane, turn it down to 30. As long as the guy keeps getting them, turn it down. And then is a, when he misses them, you go up by five. Then you go up by five until he gets them. And when he gets them at two ascending levels, that's his SRT, speech reception thresholds. And now I'll stop, I'll share screen and I'll show you why we use spondee words. There's a reason why we use spondees and not single syllable words. You have to use spondees. The reason you're using spondees is because they give, just like pure tones, they give a steep psychometric function. A steep, and if you have a peek at this slide, pretend the guy's threshold is zero. And I, look at this. If I'm at minus 10, he's not getting any of the spondy words. In other words, when I'm 10 dB below his threshold, he's not getting them. If I present them 10 dB above his threshold, he's getting them all the time. So just like pure tones, spondy words give a steep PI function. If I use single syllable words, say the word cow, say the word cup, say the word C, say the word tree, if I read single syllable words, let's say your threshold was zero for speech. Let's say you could hear all the way down to zero. If I presented the single syllable words at zero, you're only getting a few percent. If I present single syllable words at 10 dB above your threshold, you're only getting about 30 or 40 percent. It's only when I get to about 30 decibels above your threshold, now you're getting them all. So the decibel distance between getting all or bugger all ain't small. It's big. That's why single syllable words cannot be used for speech testing. Spondees do. Because, like pure tones, they give steep PI functions. You either got them or you didn't. Okay? And I'll show you my way of showing it here. Spondee words. This is a prettier slide. I make it... Marine green, isn't that special? Okay, so pretend the guy's threshold is 15. 
15 dB, okay? If that's his threshold for hearing speech, pretend that's his threshold for hearing the, the, the spawn D words. If I say the words at 10, he's now almost never getting them. If I read them at 15, yep, he's getting them about 75% of the time. If I read them at 20, he's always getting them, okay? The same cannot be said for single syllable words. One syllable words don't do it. If I read one syllable words, if let's say my threshold for hearing speech is zero. If I read one syllable words at 10 or whatever, he's never getting them. If I read one syllable words at 20, you might get it about 30% of them. If I read one syllable words at 30, now you're getting about 70%. And if I read one syllable words at 40, now you're starting to get them all. So the decibel distance for spondees between getting all and diddly all is small. That's why I drew this here. Whereas the decibel distance between getting all and diddly all for single syllable words ain't small. And that is why, that is how come W-H-Y-H-O-W-C-O-M-E, this is why we test threshold for speech with spondy words. And that's how we end today's 110 Zoom session. Next week, we will come into a summary of decibel differences. We'll talk about three different decibel references. We've got two of them down, SPL and HL. Next week, I'll introduce you to the third one called sensation level, but we won't spend much time on it. You've actually undergone, in my opinion, one of the more difficult aspects of psychoacoustics. There's a lot of people that stumble completely on what I've talked about this morning and they can't get past it. Okay, here's hoping that this Zoom session has clarified some of that. Do your readings in Lassen Woodford, keep up with it, but I think we've covered it fairly well today. I'm, I'm pleased with, I think it's gone okay. I don't know, that's my mental feeling about it. And uh, so we'll look at sensation level a little bit next week. That's your third reference. You have DBSPL here, DBHL here. We'll talk DBSL here. And then we will move on to what's called binaural hearing. And we'll finish this unit next week and talk about two ears as opposed to one ear. All right. That would be just great. That's the plan anyhow. I'll see you at 1.20 later on. I guess it's 11, oh, it must be about 12.30 Central Time. It's 10.30 Pacific Time. And I'll see you in a few hours for 1.20. Okay? Good stuff. I'll stop recording here. See you, Audra.